Yeah, probably. They seem like an old couple. Uh, stream manager. Okay. There we go. Let's go to remind. Sorry, I'm in, I had to forgot to pause your video on the Twitch. Oh yeah. Otherwise, I get a nice echo. Yep. Um, let's see here. Uh, come hang out at uh, twitch.tv slash StanleyTrio8. Yeah, I do, I do like the ending in the way that, like, I think the idea that man's folly is going to be what destroys man. Like, yeah. the, the plane crashes into the... Are you saying this where the kids can hear you if they're in the chat room and you're spoiling it for them? Oh, you're right. I shouldn't. No spoilers here. This is a spoiler, <laughs> spoiler-free chat. Hi, him the ant. <laughs> I just saw him t say hi, and I was like, oh wait. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Um, let me make sure nobody else quizzed this morning. Alon, shame on you. Alon still hasn't quizzed. Kevin, Daniel, Kevin, Mark. I think I got all those people. Hey, Miss Sahar, Rachel, Catherine, Conrad. Um, Tam, Catherine, and Natalie. Did I get Natalie? I did get Natalie, okay. Um, Arlene, Elise, Rachel, and Natalie. Oh, Michelle. Michelle was the last holdout that has yet, that has completed it. Is Brian in there? Oh, Brian's not in the class. Neither is Kenneth. Thanks for telling me, fellas. Let me add them real quick. Uh, add them back in. I think Kenneth just joined the Remind, if I remember the thing I got correctly. Yeah, that's very possible. And McMahon posted that stuff, so you might be getting some... Some interest. Some frosh interest. Yeah, we might. We have two sophomores already, although one was in my class. You already read the plot. Hey, you improved kinda. That's good. One question at a time. <laughs> um. Yeah, that uh, that ending is uh, it's it's not bad. It's just yeah, it's um. It left me wanting. Yeah, it's a little anticlimactic, but also that's probably very likely the point. Yeah. Right. I think that was like, you know, almost the whole nature of Baconanism in a sense. That one question thing stays. Oh yeah. Then you'll be at you know five thousand before we know it. I wonder when T. S. Eliot wrote *The Wasteland*. Let me look that up. Cause I wonder if that was an influencing factor. Yeah, I wonder. Um. This, this book certainly seems more anti-religious, maybe, than anything else. 1922. So, a ways yeah. before that. Who would have been exposed to it? It's possible. Alright, I'm going to go and get started, and I'm going to start with uh, the... Um, let's see here. I'm going to start with the PowerPoint, uh, presenting all the uh, stickers for today. Uh, we're only giving stickers to people who scored thousands because eight gajillion of you scored thousands. Um, just to reiterate, just to make sure we know, please do not have the book or the PDF out while you are quizzing. Um, I'm not saying y'all did. I'm just saying uh, I thought my quiz was hard. <laughs> um, so, yeah. With that being said, uh, here we go. The medals, if you guys want to clap virtually. Uh, and the honors, we have Elise, we have Ashif, we have Huda, we have Catherine, we have Naveen, we have Rachel, we have Saloni, we have Tane, we have Umer. So congratulations. Clap. Woo! Clap oh, for all clapping, them. Clapping, clapping. <laughs> uh, let, me, let, me let me get my video captured back up so I can uh, show that I am clapping. Yay, woo! Woo! <laughs> Lots of thousands there. Uh, in the... Let's see here. In the Scholastics, uh, we have Abigail. We have Anthony. 
Uh, we have Arnold. We have Catherine. Uh, we have Erlene. We have Isabella. Uh, we have Josh. Uh, we have Kevin F. Kevin Fang. We have Emery. Uh, we have Megan Wang. And we have Sahar. And that's it. Yay! Congratulations. Y'all did great. Woo! Uh, and then lastly, certainly not leastly, uh, in the varsity category, uh, we have Surya, we have Conrad, and we have Leah. Yay! Congratulations. Yay. Uh, Surya and Leah, no tend to be on here, so congratulations to y'all. Um, the rest of you guys, everybody did really well. I'm, I'm very happy. Uh, and I might not have gotten everybody, but that's because uh, some people maybe uh, have it. Oh, yes, I need to add Michelle to the Scholastics. Michelle also got 100. Um, she took it maybe a little, let's say a little past deadline, so I'm not going to put her name over here. Um, but congratulations, Michelle, as well. Um, let me go in and make sure I got everybody there. Yeah, hopefully today's quiz is a little, uh, you know, uh, uh, better in terms of making sure may maybe it's just a little tougher. Let's say let's hope it's a little tougher I want to see some I want to see some non 100s um, Okay, well, we got a hundred we got a 96 we got a 96 we got a hundred we got a hundred we got a hundred we got a hundred so eh, a Little column a little column B a lot of hundreds uh, good job to y'all getting hundreds well done uh, Oh Michelle went ahead and did to, uh, today's already too. So she she went ahead and doubled up there you go. It is progressive. Clapping, more clapping. Yes, thank you. Uh, it was weirder, today's quiz. I mean, I wrote them all pretty much cons consecutively, so it shouldn't be too much weirder, but maybe that's just the content is weirder. Uh, let me get this out of the way. Uh, oh, that reminds me. I've now started to do art, um, art videos. Uh, my first art video should be up on YouTube at this point. Was there anything that said he was rich? I don't remember, man. I wrote these questions like three weeks ago. Who? Jonah? Is Jonah rich? Uh, I do not know. Uh, Cat's Cradle. Chapters 11 through 15. Uh, I usually do a good job kind of um, reviewing this beforehand. I was not able to today uh, due to having uh, not being a lot into my house for a brief moment. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. uh, 11. Newt, I don't remember them saying anything about Newt being particularly wealthy at this point in the book. Now, later, perhaps, but at this point, he's just a dropout medical student. Yep. As far as we know. All right, so we got we got two talkers in the chat. Anybody else want to join in on the uh, say hi in the conversation so we can get more people kind of answering questions? There's Ashith. Uh, they mentioned something about Frank possibly living a rich life when they talked about Secret Agent X Nine, right? Possibly, which um, turns out Secret Agent X Nine um, was just making, well, he was making he was doing a lot of things. Well, they. I think if you go back and look at it, he didn't call himself that. His high school friends or people called him that. So they, I think they were kind of making fun of him because he was trying to be more mysterious than he might have actually been. Right. Yeah, yeah. They were definitely, they were definitely making him out to be again a secret agent. But instead, he was building a building a model uh, neighborhood or city, and then also. Um, Doing some other extracurriculars. Um, all right, so let's get this going uh, real quick. We'll see. We'll see uh, if three of you guys are good enough for a uh, responsive chat here. Okay. Um, so, um, who was supposed to give the commencement address, and then who ended up giving uh, the commencement address at Sandra and the bartender's uh, commencement? It's supposed to be Dr. Honaker. Right, it's supposed to be Dr. Honaker, uh, but then it eventually ended up being Dr. Breed. And they talk about him being all out of breath um, uh, and stuff like that. And they talk about having careers in science. 
little stem guy. Um, and then what does he say? What does Dr. Breed say the problem with the world is at this point? Somebody in a rainstorm? That might also be me. I have a leaky faucet. My my apartment's falling apart. Ah. Uh. See if that does it. Yeah, that they are superstitious and that superstition is causing problems. Right, too superstitious the world is. Right. Uh, this is also, by the way, chapter 11. Right. Um, and that everybody studied science more, there'd be no problems. Um, which is just universally ironic uh, with the rest of this book. Um um, and so they say that they read in the paper that the life, the secret to life was discovered the other day. Um, and what is that secret of life that they believe, or they believe the secret of life is, or at least they read about in some sort of newspaper. Uh, I got to silence my phone as well. <laughs> a little bit of a mess today. Little, department. Yeah, I'm a little bit, a little bit of a mess. Uh, yeah, they believe the secret to life is protein. Um, or the secret of life is protein. They found out something about protein. And they're like, yeah, that's it. And that's chapter 11. Uh, pretty quick little chapter there. Uh, on to chapter 12. Will Miss Cox join us now? Oh, because we're doing biology or something? No. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, all right, so... Uh, the, uh, so they, we introduced a new character, the older bartender. So we got the bartender who is, um, uh, uh, classmates with Frank. Sandra and, and then, Frank. say again? He's classmates with Frank and Sandra. So. Yeah, right. And Frank. Um, and then, um, and then he comes over and wants to talk about the day the bomb dropped. Um, and they said he had, he had a, he talked about his voice and his nose. And what did he say about his voice and his nose? <sighs> the WC Fields Twang, which, uh, Mr. Johnson, can you, uh, can you look who up? W. Well, W. C. Fields was an old comedic actor. He was a larger guy, and he had he was known for kind of playing. I don't want to say drunk bums, but that kind of character where you're like, oh, okay, you could be a drunk or a bum, even if we're not going to call you that. <laughs> there you go. Um, okay. How did you know that? Did you look this up already, or did you just know about him? I just I just know him. Okay. Turn Turner Classic Movies might have been my favorite channel growing up. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Um, all right. Well, I may have tried to start a classic movies club. <laughs> maybe, just maybe. <laughs> um, uh, all right. So they talk about the Cape Cod room, and back then it wasn't the Cape Cod room. What was it before the Cape Cod room? And then what was it before that that other name? So we got we got three different names for the bar here. Navajo Thing is not the name. Navajo, Navajo Room, also not the name. Navajo TP is the name, yes. Navajo TP, and what's ironic about, or I don't know if ironic, I, I keep using that word a lot. Um, and then the pomp, Pompey Room. Um, that is basically how it's said. Pompey? Pompey? <laughs> Pompey. <laughs> uh, the Navajo TP, what's ironic about, about that name? Navajos don't use teepees, yep. Uh, and then the Pompey Room, which which uh, I think everybody associates Pompey with the the famous volcano that exploded, which to me is like I could see it, you know, maybe uh, uh, a reference to the atomic bomb, right? Kind of like a volcano, um, or maybe uh, maybe a later thing uh, that is going to cover the Earth, right, and kind of end life, kind of like the volcano did to Pompey. I've actually been to Pompey or Pompeii. <laughs> Sorry. I was like, Pompeii's the place. Pompey was a person. He was one of the oh, really? emperors or something. Yeah, yeah, he was the Roman emperor. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, they talked about busted plaster in the Pompeii room uh, and the Navajo TP tom toms and Indian blankets and cow skulls. Right. Um, and now it's the Cape Cod room, and we have a, a different connection to Cape Cod. Have we already gotten that? Or Yes, yeah, I, I've gotten to that. I mean, there's a. I think they've already gotten to that, right? Maybe they haven't. Maybe that's not happened yet. Okay, I can't, it's hard to because I'm going back and forth. Yeah, same. <laughs> I remember. Now that I'm done, I might not be. I might not have too much of an issue. Uh, yes, Heyman, as you are getting at uh, that, the Cape Cod is where the Honaker will die. Um, so uh, they they talk about uh, a bum comes in that day, uh, and so he mixes him. He mixes him the day the bomb drops, um, and he mixes him a drink. And what is that drink uh, called? And what's in it? Uh, uh. That sounds disgusting. Yeah, it doesn't sound great. <laughs> it's the end of the world drink. The yeah, end of the world something. End of the world blank. The end of the world delights. It's got the it's got the hollow pineapple. Uh, yeah, it's it's a hollowed out pineapple. I cannot write this morning, this afternoon, whatever time it is. Time is but a social construct that we no longer abide by. Yeah, exactly. Um, a hollow pineapple, cream, creme de menthe, which is uh, like a, it's like a minty liquor liqueur, right? Yeah, it's just it's. Uh, comparable, I would think, to drinking Listerine. Yeah, me too. I've never had it. It's it's very much a, a thing of the times, uh, the 60s. Uh, yeah. Like, I know in Mad Men, it was one of, like, the big Christmas drinks they would have. Yeah, they gotta have the accent. Don't forget about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, like, a, like a milky Listerine yeah. is yes. basically yeah. what it is. It sounds terrible. <laughs> um... So, and then they say another guy uh, uh, comes in from the research laboratory and quits because he was, whatever he was going to make was going to be used as a weapon. Um, and then uh, that was, uh, who was the man who came in and said he was quitting? Yes, that was Dr. Breed's son. who um, I believe is going to get talked about later as well, uh, very briefly. Uh, and then, no, that's also Breed's son. Yeah. I mean, also Breed, obviously, after the bomb, is still working at the lab because he's the one who uh, is in correspondence with Jonah. Yeah, and he, uh, yeah, he, he uh, yeah, his, his uh, father's the boss. Yeah. Um, and then he talks about uh, an ugly city Ilium is, and Bakonan responds uh, in a way, problem within his own head, what an ugly city every city is. Um, let's see here. For those of you wondering if there's a literary reference here, there totally is. What is that? You have like? that that ah god that kind of um, in Latin would be the vocative case, but that that talking to. Um, uh, like directly to an absent or imaginary person, mm -hmm. then that's called an an apostrophe. Mm. Not to be confused with, you an know, apostrophe. that apostrophe. <laughs> right. <laughs> so an apostrophe is talking to a person who isn't there, kind of thing, like a rhetorical conversation almost. Right. A lot of times you'll see it prefaced with prefaced with o, but in this one we have a. Ah, but same concept. There you go. That's cool. I've seen that term a lot used on quizzes. Uh, for decathlon, so that's good to know. Yeah. Um, and ilium, by the way, I looked it up. Vonnegut uses ilium to represent Schenectady. Okay. Uh, is that correct? Schenectady? Schenect I can't see your screen. You didn't share it with me. Oh, I didn't share it. I'm so sorry. Give me one second. Um... I think it's Schenectady. I don't know. Who cares? Nobody knows how to spell it but people who live there. That's a good point. <laughs> uh, Synecdoche. I thought it was Synecdoche. 
I think. But that's also the, like a literary term. Yeah. I think the city has like a K or a C after the S. Pyromantics, Pyromantica says Synecdoche, Haymans. Okay, so I think I'm right. On the pronun on the spelling, the pronunciation, Schenectady might be correct. I have no idea. Um, well, you are you're talking about the city and not the literary term, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think they're the same, right? Like in. Uh, I don't know. Oh, I I have. I'm sorry. I was it's not right. S C H. S C H. The city. S C H E N E C T A D Y. Okay, C A C C H E N E. C T A D Y. C T A D Y. That's terrible. That's awful. And people should, should like voluntarily live there. <laughs> uh, only if they worked at the General Ford Forge and Foundry. Um, <laughs> so we we come up on the next morning. Uh, and, and Ilya might be o ugly to Jonah only because he's very hungover, but it also might just be ugly. Um, so he's hungover. He's in a, he's in the car with Dr. Asa Breed and he starts to describe Dr. Breed and what are the things that are said about Dr. Breed to characterize him? Pink old man. Okay. Yeah, he's pink. Uh, pink old man. Okay. Uh, that's one down. One, uh, quite a few to go. Uh, prosperous. Right, very wealthy. Beautifully dressed. I feel like it was a missed opportunity for Vonica to use the word sartorial here. Sartorially inclined. What does that mean? Sartorial, it's a manner of dress. Okay. Uh, what about his manner? There's there's four things about his manner as well. He's civil. Civilized. Optimistic. Serene yeah, yes. and capable. There you go. Thank Yesterday you, we had... Yesterday we had polysyndeton here with this list where there's no conjunctions mm -hmm. in the list. We have asyndeton. Okay. Asyndeton. For those of us keeping track. We should be. Um, and then they talk about him. He's bristly, diseased, and cynical. Right? Jonah is uh, spending the night with Sandra. Um, and then he says his soul seems as foul as smoke from burning cat fur. Which is interesting a lovely imagery there yes agreed um so yeah uh uh he apparently he got the down low on dr breed from sandra um and what is the down low about dr breed according to sandra or at least according to the people in ilium also the name ilium makes me think of like a sick city like it's ill yeah. Yeah. Dr. Breed, Hart's Felix's wife. Yes. Dr. Breed loved, uh, loved, uh, uh, Dr. Honecker's wife. Right. Um, Emily Honecker. Yeah. Um, uh, and then also, uh, they thought that, uh, he was the father of the children, of the three children, which would make a lot of sense. Dr. Honecker does not seem like somebody who cares about having children or cares about doing the things needed to have children. Yeah, but his kids seem an awful lot like him. They do, but also, they, I mean, Dr. Breed doesn't seem too, too much better, but I do agree with that. Um, well, and his name is Dr. Breed. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, Dr. Breed. Uh, yes. Uh, that is, yeah, that could be a thing. They would have known each other for 22 years. Uh, yeah, exactly. Hey, man, I get what you're saying. Yeah, there, it's a well, it's a possibility that, that like Dr. Honecker's kids just picked up his way of looking at the world, 
you know? Nature versus nurture kind of thing? Yeah. Um, held a message for reason identity. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I could see... Yeah, Leah, again, I could see that. Um, apparently, Honaker... Oh! They, they, they kept the term Honaker. They were like, hey, do you want to prove Leah's post? I think because of the N-I-K-K-E-R at the end. They censored Felix's last name? I did not realize that. That's interesting. Um, all right, so... Um, so, Dr. Breed uh, talks to talks to um, Jonah in the car, starts asking him about Ilium, what he thinks about it. Um, he says there's no nightlife, right? There's no real nightlife there, which Jonah would probably agree with because he said he found the one place, basically, the, the beginning and end of the nightlife. Uh, at the uh, Cape Cod room. Um, and what does Dr. Breed say to kind of um, confirm that the city is wholesome? What is what, what does he point out about the city? I found this I found this little tidbit from Dr. Breed interesting. Yeah, there's no no juvenile delinquency. Uh, like, that's somehow the the sign of a great town. It's very fifties, right? It's very um. Yeah, it's like we don't have any of those outsiders here. Right. It reminds me of a, it's those rock Rockwellian kind of you know. Oh, everything's perfect here, right? Um, also, like a little bit reminiscent of a future location to me. This idea of like there's no crime here. Uh, kind of thing, uh, almost attempting to be um, uh, utopian, right? Well, yeah, and it's very much uh, a city of its time, and you kind of get that reference throughout it. This chapter, as they're explaining Ilium, I mean, you probably glanced over this part where it talks about when Dr. Breed was driving, tracks of a long abandoned trolley system catch, catch, kept catching the wheels of his car. Mm -hmm. that yeah. Was pretty common in the northeast uh when they would build out these suburbs and this is really before the suburb boom of the post-war post-world war ii period mm -hmm. this would have been in the early 1900s in the kind of industrial second industrial revolution mm -hmm. they would build these suburbs and connect them with trolley systems so you could still commute yeah. Uh, so you see that, and then you see this it's a family town there's no nightlife it's very wholesome then you're tying it into the kind of Levittown, uh, it's ugly, right? Everything's the same suburbs of the of the 50s, the mm -hmm. post-war period. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I did not realize that about the trolley thing. Like, I, I, I caught that a little bit. It's like, it reminded me more of like, um, almost like a, a old abandoned mining town kind of thing. Um, but yeah, no, there you go. That's I did not know that. Um, Hamant, when he said people came here from the east, did he consider uh, Ilium as Ellis Island? Kind of. Uh, I could I could see that. that. That seems like a possible... Where does he say they come here from the east? Uh, they come here from... F f well, if it's a jumping off place for western migration, right? The idea might be, you know, they're coming from the east. Oh, I, I thought that that might be that it was somehow in the neighborhood of the Erie Canal because you know once you have that lock system and they can connect it then you can use New York as a jumping off place sure. to get yourself mm -hmm. as it they went to the Ohio River mm -hmm. they floated the Ohio River until they had to start going by land mm -hmm. so it's like that connecting piece between the Erie Canal and the Ohio River okay okay um so yeah, they talk about that, and then they say the research library research laboratory was used used to be used for what. Uh, for the whole county. Public hangings. That's right. Public hangings. And the old stockade, which if you don't remember what the stockades are, that's where people would have to lock their head, hands and head through for public shame. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not opposed to bringing those back. <laughs> um... Wow, I didn't know you were such a capital punishment kind of person. <laughs> I just, I like the public shame aspect of it. Can you imagine stockades with Instagram? Come on. That'd be great, yes. <laughs> this is the stockade account for Houston, Texas. 
Um, so, um, and then they talked about one man here uh, who was hanged. Uh, what is his name? When was he hanged? And what did he do? Seventeen eighty two. This is an old city. George Minor Moakley, not Oakley. Which for the second time now, and not the last time, we have somebody with three names. Uh George Minor Moakley. Uh, he killed twenty six people. Um so this is the 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 second and this might just be something I'm keeping track of, but we, we had our guy who was sent to prison for killing his brother, uh, who had three names. Uh, now we have George Minor Moakley, who killed 26 people with three names. Uh, of course, we have, um, I don't know if, I, I don't think, you know, like John Wayne Gacy, I don't think he was quite uh, doing his thing yet. Um, but, uh, of course, um, John Wilkes Booth and uh, the guy I always keep forgetting, the JFK guy, Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah, but Lee Harvey Oswald, if this book was, what, 63? It's the same year, yeah, I looked it up. So I doubt he so, thought that through. Or would have even known about it yet, because it was probably, I mean, that's the end of November of 63, so that probably hadn't happened when this was published. Yeah, I think it was actually published, like, right around then, like October, November. Um, so, yeah, uh, but I think... I wonder. I think there's a there's one more person I think that got, that has three names in this book, and I kind of want to go back and see what if they end up doing anything. I just find it interesting that the two three named people so far have both been in prison or, or killed, uh, executed for a crime. Um, and then he talks about him singing a song, um, and that he wasn't sorry. And then at my favorite part of this entire chapter is the last line, right? Doctor Breed kind of like one of the guys who helped build the atom bomb uh is like that guy had 26 people on his conscience right uh and then jonah replies uh the mind reels you know kind of like the mind uh retracts back in this thought of possibly killing 26 people uh very sarcastically you know uh, uh kind of poking fun at dr breed uh, one thing I want to point out is where he talks about he sang a song on the scaffold, he sang a song he'd composed for the occasion. Mm -hmm. Well, there we have that kind of repetition at the beginning of of uh, the phrases again, but also within it you have the same uh, verb used in different tenses, mm -hmm. uh, or the repetition of words derived from the same root. Mm -hmm. That's uh, polyptoton. Pol pol I, just, I, I know, I, just, I wanted to see how you were going to spell it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's T-O-T-O-N, but yeah. I got close. You did. Six, I got sixth place <laughs> in my sixth grade spelling bee, so I got some chops. <laughs> I always intentionally spelled the word wrong so I could go sit down. <laughs> uh, I, I got mine wrong because I repeated a part of the word, and I was very upset. Um... All right, so this one, this is about the, the weird car. Um, so the head wobbles on his stiff neck like he's a dead body. Um, and then the trolley tracks come back up again. Um, why are people trying to get to the... Why are 30,000 people trying to get to the General Forge and Foundry, do you think? And then why are there policemen? I think I think those two things go together. I would presume I could be totally wrong. Maybe thirty thousand people work at the foundry. That seems like a lot of people. It does seem like a lot of people. Uh, they work there. I mean, it's possible. Miss Johnson, do you have a, a theory? Um, honestly, I didn't think too much about it. I kind of figured that it was probably just a gigantic government program. Mm hmm. All of the, you know, the Pentagon, some ridiculous number of people work there every day. It's like 90,000 people. Sure. That's fair. Um, I guess it is. Yeah, I guess it is just people people going to work. I was thinking of, like, some sort of protest, you know, like uh, anti, 
like almost like a Dow Chemical anti-company protest. I don't know. It says, I asked Dr. Breed how many people were trying to reach the General Forge and Foundry Company by 8 o'clock. He told me 30,000. That sounds like it might be something that happens on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the 700 people work there, but I think that's only within the lab. And then there's the actual Forge and Foundry component, right? The, the lab is only, yeah, a chunk of the company. I would assume. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, like their R&D department. Yeah. Um, so yeah, okay. Maybe I was just I was just going to I was going too far um, in my own head. So they kind of go through talking about uh, stop and go signs, which are garish ghosts. Um, and then what what story does Doctor Bree tell about Doctor Honecker at this point? Yeah, he leaves his car in the middle of traffic one day. Uh, he didn't want to deal with the traffic. Uh, then they kind of list off some things uh, uh, that that was left there. Um, and it talked about uh, the uh, the motor running, the cigar, and the ashtray, and the fresh flowers in the vases, 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 vases. Uh, and then they talked about the what what's up with this car? What is this car? I don't know if that's the name of the type of car now that I'm thinking about it. A Marmon. What is a Marmon? Okay. It is a motor car company. Okay. Oh, it's one of those old school cars. Yeah, it looks like something that would have been driven around by, like, Al Capone. Yeah, that's a Marmon. And so apparently, like I said, Vaz is kind of right here on the... Where the mirrors would be today, I guess, is what, they, what they're saying, right? Sounds like it. Uh, on the doorposts, yeah. And Felix likes to put fresh flowers in the vases every morning, right? Um, and then he says, like, the Maria Celeste, which I do not know what that is. Uh it's a merchant ship that was uh, discovered adrift and deserted in the Atlantic Ocean, but oh, totally seaworthy. Uh, okay, so the Maria Celeste is a merchant ship. Is that what you said? Yeah. Adrift merchant ship. Very it makes cool. you feel better. It's a brigantine. Ah, yes. Now I have a clearer image of this ship in my mind. And uh, this is the one, I think, that it was like completely abandoned and no one ever knew what happened to the ship's crew. <laughs> okay. Um, huh, that's interesting. I actually just played a video game a few years ago very similar to that idea. It was very good. It's called uh, The Return of the Obra Dinn. I highly recommend it. Uh, but you guys have work to do right now, so what are we saying? Um, so, uh, who, uh, how is the car returned to Felix? Yeah, Emily goes back and get the car. Uh, Emily gets the car. And then what happens after she gets the car? She gets into an accident. And then that accident did something to her pelvis. Which, by hurting her pelvis, kills her during childbirth. Which, um, you know, maybe the truth. Uh, but I, I don't trust Dr. Breed when it comes to, uh, the notion of what Emily did or didn't do and how she died. I do not trust him to say the truth. Uh, but, the, you know, it's probably true. Yeah, he didn't want to get it. Yes, they called, Dr. H was called first and then he was like, ah, I'm busy looking at turtles or something. Um, I don't want to get it and his wife wouldn't got it. Okay. Um, yeah, you say if he secretly loves her, yeah, I mean, he could, that could influence how he views this, you know, he, he might have resentment against Felix for how he treated Emily, 
and blame him because he didn't go get the car and then she got into the accident and then that is what he thinks killed her so I mean yeah. there, there could be an emotional tangle there yeah definitely um, alright so we get into chapter 15 which is into the into the research lab we go um, and uh, so there's 700 researchers or se sorry 700 workers at the lab as we pointed out already so there's 700 workers which you know we have 30,000 total uh, at the general forge and foundry right and so like the the whole company itself is a metallurgy company right it's a forge and a foundry at least according to the name right um and so 700 workers of that 30,000 are part of the lab team and uh what part of that lab team is researchers and what do the rest do if he loves her, if he's comfortable talking about her, why would he lie? Uh, he might be lying to, um, you know, to protect himself or protect, uh, uh, you know, uh, Emily. Uh, it may not be a lie so much as it is just his colored version of or his truth. Right. That may not be the whole truth. I mean, you, you figure when Newt was born, first of all, he was going to be a complicated pregnancy because he's, uh, you know, a dwarf. Mm -hmm. And his mom was probably a geriatric pre pre pregnancy at that point because, I mean, his sister was 16 years older than him. Yeah. And not probably in her late 30s or early 40s. Yeah. There's already yeah. other complications there. Yep. Definitely. Yeah, I, I, I do see it as, like, I felt it could be just, yeah, coming up with a reason as opposed to, like, and, and finding a way to blame Dr. Honecker, which is really, when really it's just, oh, she was... You know, yeah, she was older and complications occur and are more likely when you're older. Uh, which also, like, again, 22 years after your first child, right? And as as um, as Newt mentioned about Dr. Honecker, he's not an attractive man. And I'm sure that did not get better with age. Uh, <laughs> so I wonder, I, that makes me think that Newt very much could have been somebody else's child. If his Maybe Dr. Breed. Yeah, if his mom was so old, why did it say Zinka was old enough to be his mom? That's just, like, it was just the math of it. Yeah, Zinka was 42, knew it was, what, 23, 24 at the time? So, you know, if she had him in 18, 19, you know, old enough to be a mother. Uh, I think it's just a kind of turn of phrase more than anything. Yeah, I don't think it was saying his mom specifically. I think she was just old enough to be his mom should she have had a child yep. when he was born. Alright, is here. We are now introduced to Miss Pefko, uh, who um, is the kind of greets them uh, and identifies the greeter. Um, and they talk about Miss Pefko, 20, vacantly pretty and healthy, very dull, normal, which, you know, those, those first three things don't necessarily add up to that. But I, I think, I think that is, I think that is made more clear when we see about a, another woman that uh, Jonah will meet later in the book. Um, she's the secretary of Dr. Horvath, uh, who we never meet, I don't believe. I don't think we meet him. Uh, secretary of Dr. Horvath, and what's kind of her relationship with Dr. Horvath? Uh, and specifically, like, the, the stuff that Dr. Horvath is doing. And I guess also, what is he researching? He thinks too much? Okay. Makes her feel dumb? Yeah. That feels dumb in the face of Dr. Horvath's studies. Uh, and he is studying surface chemistry. Which I think also um, is a little bit of an allusion to future stuff, possibly. Um, yeah, all scientists think too much, and so she feels dumb because she doesn't understand what's happening. She just has to type it all up, right? Um, which I think is like I think especially when we meet event. Which spoiler warning: we're gonna meet uh, um, we're gonna meet Frank. Uh, Frank is very much 
smart with technical ideas, I guess, at least according to him. But he's very terrible when it comes to interacting with people. And what we seem to have here is basically an entire company, at least 600 housekeepers, who are all there to be people who interact with humans on behalf of researchers, right? And basically coming up with this idea that these, I, I'm kind of seeing like researchers like are missing half of the, the points of life, which is to be able to interact with people, right? If you go back to when they were talking about Dr. Breed um, uh, giving the commencement speech, right? Uh, he showed up all out of breath and gave some kind of talk, right? Like instead of instead of necessarily like being charismatic and being able to interact with people, he's just kind of talking at him. Um, and so I'm kind of, I think we're kind of seeing here with like people like Miss Pefko, uh, who is, who seems nice, right? And seems to be good at talking to people um is kind of the the opposite of the the scientists who are thinking too much um at least again and i think this is all kind of finally mirrored in in frank and his relationship with jonah um but yeah sorry just a little little rant there um <laughs> So, uh, we then get a, we, we talk about this, this woman shows up, uh, this was weird, um, and, and this woman, uh, what does she, uh, uh, she turns, uh, to, uh, look at Dr. Breed, and kind of looks at him with reproach, uh, and she hated people who thought too much, um, and then, so, this, this kind of coverall woman seems to represent, uh, uh, all of mankind, which I just found was very interesting, uh, especially because what these thinkers are gonna do gonna do to mankind by the end of the book, uh, and what they've already done with the atomic bomb, right? I think I think, um, you know, when I first read this, I kind of looked at her like, man, she she's lame. Like, why is she looking like this? But as the book kind of continues i think you you kind of look back on her with a little more understanding uh, uh leah well they said in her mind all she could find uh was kleenex and costume jewelry um her smile was glassy and she was ransacking her mind for something to say finding nothing in it but used kleenex and costume jewelry um yeah that is that is a bad look from jonah uh kind of like you know uh, Miss Pefko didn't, I don't think, deserves that. Um, and so, uh, anyways, uh, this this kind of coveralls woman, who they also refer to as the fat woman, uh, again, kind of talking down these non-scientists, right? Uh, as we've seen with Miss Pefko, right? Uh, um, like, their, their characterization is very negative, which I just find interesting. Uh, it doesn't really seem like she's portrayed as a secretary. Miss Pefko? Yeah. Um I think well they say they say she is, right? For for Dr. uh Neil Sack Horvath, the secretary. Yeah, it says right, uh introduced her as a secretary, Dr. Neil Sack Horvath. I know, but then you, you see her in filthy coveralls. That's not really how a secretary you would think would dress. But I, see, uh, that's where I think the the writing of this section is weird because I don't think that is Miss Pefko because they're just saying. Uh, 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 oh, she's the one who responded to what Miss Pefko said. Yes, I got it. Yes, it it does. It does go weird there. Yeah, this this woman just shows up out of nowhere. Yes, it is another <laughs> lady. Yeah, it's not correct. Yeah, you guys are right. Uh, again, I just think it's kind of weird to to kind of parse out. Um, uh, and of course, what does Doctor Breed say when Miss Pefko tells him, "You guys all just think too much." Yeah, it's not that uh, uh, scientists think differently or think too much. Is that scientists think about different things than other people do. Which is another, just another example of kind of scientific elitism in a way, right? Oh, we don't think, we don't, we don't think more. We just think differently, you know? Um, uh, and so, um, 
Miss Pefko then kind of, kind of goes on, um, and uh, uh, and then they kind of start to hint at uh, the the big the big item of the book. Uh, he's maybe talking about something that's going to turn everything upside down, inside out, like the atom bomb. Um, <laughs> I was waiting for someone to blow up with that response. Yeah, right. Um, well, just you wait, Heyman. It. it might happen yet. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, uh, we get a story from Miss Pefko about she, when she comes home from school and mom, her mom would ask her about what happened. And now what does she say when her mom asked her what happened at work that day? I need the exact quote. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Does this remind anybody of anything? Epizeusis. Epi Epizeusis. Yeah, we've got another Epizeusis. We do. Um, which, uh, if I can scroll back here, see if I can find it. It's very early in the book. Very very early that we've seen this before. Uh, yeah, repeat, well, repeating stuff three times, but also, like, night, the, uh, the Baconan Calypso, nice, nice, very nice, uh, nice, nice, very nice, right, um, that kind of reminds me of that, almost like a chant, right, like a chant when the world is in your face and, and you're not sure what's happening, um, and there was something, there was something that Bacona said when, like, the world is unexplainable, I think also might have been Epizeusis. How do you spell that again, Epizeusis? E-P-I-Z-E-U-X-I-S. Epizeusis. Yeah, I think what you're talking about is the busy, 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 but I don't think we've gotten to that yet. Yes, busy, 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 yeah. Which I think we're also seeing right here that Miss um, Pefko is a Baconist, Bacononist, a Boko. Uh, it's kind of maybe what's happening there. Um, she's a Boko without knowing she's a Boko? Yep. Which I believe uh, Jonah hints at, or tells, says several times within the, at, throughout the book, this person's a, a Boko, they just don't know it. Um, including himself at, at, at certain points. Um, and then Dr. Breed's like, well, if there's something you don't understand, ask Dr. Horvath to explain it. Um, and then... Uh, uh, what does, uh, Dr. Honecker, according to Dr. Bree, he says Dr. Honecker used to say, uh, a scientist who couldn't explain something, uh, to an eight-year-old was a what? Yeah, Dr. Horvath, the good explainer. <laughs> Dr. Bree turns out to be a pretty good explainer. Uh, yeah, you're a charlatan uh, if you don't know how to explain something to an eight-year-old, which Miss Pefko replies to with. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I, what's a charlatan, basically? Yeah. So, um, so that's the end of these sections of these chapters. Um, nothing groundbreaking here. Uh, charlatan's kind of like a, a con con man, uh, a dishonest person. Yeah, like yeah, like um, a fraud. Uh, just to make sure. I mean, uh, a, a a person falsely falsely claiming to have a special knowledge or skill. So yeah. Uh, yeah, somebody who is not actually good at what they say they are good at. Right. A liar, liar, pants on fire. Exactly. All right, so that's this section. Uh, tomorrow's is going to be 16 through 21. Um, does anybody have any questions with anything? Um, we're we're kind of getting to the we're getting to the 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 beginning of the uh, of the kind of middle middle meat of the book, I would say. Um, as soon as we're introduced to a. Uh, particular thing yeah also miss pefko is dumber than an eight-year-old tomorrow's quiz is 30 yes it's, no tomorrow's quiz is 25 yes it'll have progressive every test will have progressive every single one and just wait until i introduce the uh the um 
brain dumps next week. Oh, time for liftoff. Yep. Yeah, this Team Rocket's blasting off. <laughs> um, Alright, well, uh, let me take a look here real quick. I We had about 12 people in here right now, so to the 12 of y'all, thank you. Uh, for the three to five of y'all, I would say, that were participating, I appreciate it. Uh, we would love to have more people participating. It makes it it makes it uh, uh, a lot easier to kind of, a lot a lot quicker to get through this. But we got through this quicker than our last ones, so that's good. Um, all right, uh, thank you guys so much, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, let me turn off the stream now. How do I do that? There we go. Here.